Okay, uh, well, thank you, Brian, and uh, congratulations uh, to you and to the Blood Spasm Research Foundation for organizing such a terrific uh, symposium. Uh, I've been very fortunate to be associated with the foundation since uh, I first met Mary Lou in 1979 and have had a chance to uh, participate in many of these uh, symposia, and it's amazing how much new information I learned from my colleagues uh, at each uh, symposium. So um, I'm grateful to be invited again to participate in this particular symposium. Now, you gave me a, a challenge that uh, I'm going to try to meet the best I can uh, to cover the topic of uh, treatment uh, in 20 minutes, uh, yet uh, it's a topic that's very much on the mind of most of uh, the individuals um, in the audience, and hopefully um, I will have a chance to address some of the questions that I may not be able to cover in my presentation um, uh, during the panel discussion uh, this afternoon. So I'm the only one standing between you and your lunch, uh, so I, uh, uh, I have to be very mindful of uh, the, the time, but uh, hopefully I won't, have, uh, uh, I won't be uh, running over time. So um, uh, this is one way that somebody uh, suggested to treat uh, blood flow spasm. Um, uh, I took this picture during my visit in South Korea and Jeju Island, uh, and uh, I wonder what this was all about, but uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, it's an you know, innovative technique uh, to, to treat blepharospasm that I have never tried before. Um, and another way uh, to, to treat blepharospasm uh, would be to pry the eyes open with this device. Uh, this is from uh, the movie Clockwork Orange, um, and this is the way they treat it, uh, involuntary eye closure. Um, so we are not there yet in the, the, applying these kind of techniques uh, to blood spasm. So I'm going to stick to more conventional treatments. Uh, and uh, I just summarized uh, some of the uh, therapeutic approaches to blood spasm on this slide. Uh, it was already mentioned uh, that alleviating maneuvers uh, or sensory tricks uh, can uh, open the eyes. And I'll mention a few things uh, about it uh, in, in a moment. Uh, there are a number of devices uh, that uh, have been used to uh, open uh, the eyes, not what I just showed you from Clockwork Orange, but eyelid crutches and goggles. Uh, we talked about uh, tinted lenses. Um, and Dr. Pollock just uh, very eloquently described the treatment of uh, uh, blepharitis and dry eyes. Uh, one thing she uh, uh, didn't have a chance to mention is, is this drug, Zidra Atomic Solution, and I'm not sure if she's using it already in her practice, but it was just approved by uh, the FDA. It's a lymphocyte function associated antigen 1 antagonist uh, that apparently is quite effective in the treatment of dry eyes. And then I'll talk a little bit about medical therapies um, and uh, highlight specifically two drugs, uh, tetrabenazine and aproclonidine. Many of you probably have not heard of aproclonidine as a treatment. I'll just uh, share with you some of the new information on, on this particular approach. And then um, uh, in then two or three minutes I'm going to have uh, left, I'll talk about botulinum toxin, uh, which is obviously the treatment of choice for botulinum toxin, uh, for blood flow spasm. And uh, I know that Dr. Anderson is going to talk about peripheral treatment of uh, uh, blood flow spasm uh, through myectomy and other uh, pr uh, procedures. <clears throat> and, uh, but I will mention uh, very briefly uh, central surgery uh, for the treatment of blood flow spasm. Uh, so uh, this is from the paper that uh, I was fortunate to write with uh, Dr. Hallett and one of my uh, fellows, Dr. Patel, where we highlighted some of the sensory aspects of movement disorders. So uh, most neurologists um, uh, think uh, of movement disorders as motor disorders, but uh, in this paper we tried to highlight uh, sensory aspects of movement disorders and pointed out a number of examples uh, where a sensory system might play a role uh, in the pathophysiology and possibly even treatment of uh, uh, movement disorders, including alleviating maneuvers, which in the past has been uh, referred to as sensory tricks. Uh, I don't particularly like that term, sensory tricks, because it's not always sensory, and it's certainly not a trick. Uh, so we pro propose this term, alleviating maneuver, instead. But here's an example of a patient with blepharospasm who, uh, when he touches the uh, left uh, <coughs> eyebrow, he can open the right eye. Um, he's using um, uh, yellow tinted lenses uh, instead of uh, the other kind of lenses that most of you are familiar with. Uh, so there are a number of uh, alleviating maneuvers uh, that uh, people use uh, to uh, open their eyes. 
Uh, here's a patient with blepharospasm, cranial dystonia, cervical dystonia with enterocolis, meaning inflection of the neck. And uh, he uh, made the observation that uh, touching uh, uh, under his uh, chin uh, can uh, not only uh, alleviate his uh, jaw spasm, but also her, his blepharospasm. Uh, sometimes he actually has to pull uh, on the um, uh, upper eyelid. We call it a forced elevating maneuver as opposed to uh, other kinds of elevating maneuver where he actually has to pry his eyes open by pulling on the, the eyebrow. My eyes, they, won't, they will not so stay open. another elevating maneuver. Um, and they want to squeeze sometimes. Okay. I'm sorry, I can't see. How long have you had symptoms? Oh, uh, this is going, getting close to three years. Okay. Can you hold them open? If I see. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Do you drive? Mm-hmm. If I see. Okay. Can you go in and sing to see what happens? One day at a time, sweet Jesus, that's all I'm asking from. So this is another sensory trick. So, some blepharospasm patients talk, some people sing, uh, but um, there are uh, many ways that uh, 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 patients learn to uh, keep their eyes open. This is uh, one uh, uh, form of treatment that one of my patients shared with me uh, where she uses advanced meditation, mindfulness, uh, and uh, relaxation techniques uh, uh, that uh, she finds very helpful. And this is a website that uh, she gave me that uh, uh, she uses uh, to download uh, various uh, techniques to help her with uh, these relaxation techniques. And uh, there are a number of studies of biofeedback and uh, other kinds of relaxation techniques that uh, people have used uh, to treat blepharospasm. We already talked about photophobia, so I'm not going to talk about it uh, again. But there are, as you know, a number of uh, lenses, um, uh, the FL41 lenses, for example, that uh, are being used by patients that uh, particularly block uh, the uh, uh, 480 to nano, uh, 480 nanometers uh, um, uh, wavelength uh, that uh, is particularly helpful for patients with photophobia and blepharospasm. Now, uh, I just mentioned a little bit about eyelid crushes. And here's an example where eyelid crushes might be very, very helpful um, in, in patients, particularly if they have dermatochalasis. And uh, I'm sure Dr. Anderson is going to talk about it. This excessive uh, 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 tissue, in the, um, particularly in the upper eyelid, and it's very common in patients who have chronic blepharospasm. Uh, botulinum toxin would not be very helpful, but uh, these eyelid crutches um, can be quite, quite effective um, in this situation. And uh, I think most of you are familiar with eyelid crutches. We have an optometrist in our building uh, who is well trained to uh, uh, take uh, patients' glasses and just uh, attach these rims uh, to uh, help them uh, elevate uh, their uh, eyelids. Uh, um, it's, again, not helpful for everybody. Some patients find it somewhat uncomfortable. Uh, but it's helpful not only for patients who have blepharospasm, but also for patients who have tosses or droopy eyelids either as a side effect of botulinum toxin or for uh, uh, other reasons. So, in, again, another uh, non-medical treatment uh, for blepharospasm. Now, the vast majority of patients uh, obviously will require more than what we just described. They either will require uh, botulinum toxin injection, which is, certainly is the treatment of choice, uh, or uh, they initially may be treated with oral medications. And these are the kind of medications that we use. This is not a comprehensive list, but it is a list uh, that, uh, uh, of medications that I think are most frequently used. Uh, many of these medications have been observed by uh, physicians, and neurologists, ophthalmologists to be uh, helpful, and uh, so uh, their use is empirical, and it's not necessarily based on any kind of evidence. There are to my knowledge, there have really not been any double-blind placebo-controlled studies that done in, in the, with these medications. But many patients find it uh, helpful, uh, particularly uh, uh, drugs called anticholinergics that, drug, uh, that block acetylcholine receptors. And uh, an example would be artane and cogentin. Um, uh, these are the two anticholinergic drugs that we use most frequently. Um, even though um, maybe up to half of the patients have some benefit from these drugs, Unfortunately, many of these patients, uh, dr uh, drugs are associated with a variety of quite troublesome side effects, uh, burning of vision being probably the most common, 
Uh, and certainly patients who have glaucoma should never use anticholinergic drugs because these drugs can markedly exacerbate uh, glaucoma. Uh, other side effects include dry mouth, constipation, urinary retention, memory impairment, sedation. Those are uh, uh, side effects that are frequently associated with the use of these anticholinergic drugs. Uh, another drug uh, uh, that is uh, occasionally used in tremor blood spasm is clonazepam or clonopin, a falsitor class of drugs called benzodiazepines, such as uh, lorazepam or diazepam, ativan and valium. Uh, these uh, drugs uh, have a modest uh, effect on blood spasm. Uh, may be useful, particularly in patients who, for example, are wearing off from their botulinum, botulinum toxin injection before they come for the, their next visit, uh, they may use the, uh, these drugs, clonazepam or the anticholinergic drugs, uh, to sort of time them over until the, their next, their next botulinum toxin visit. Baclofen is another drug. Um, um, I, ha- I have sort of listed them in the order of efficacy. I, I think that's the, the third uh, 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 less effective drug, uh, uh, and again, is associated with a number of side effects, including drowsiness uh, and uh, loss of uh, disequilibrium, um, loss of equilibrium. Monomine depleters uh, are drugs uh, uh, that are exemplified by uh, tetrabenazine. I'm going to come back to that later because uh, th- this is potentially an important uh, drug uh, to, to keep in mind. Anticonvulsants and uh, the SSR uh, antagonists uh, uh, are not terribly helpful in my opinion, but uh, again, some patients do find them uh, useful. So uh, I'm going to have to move on in order to cover the topic. So let me just say a few words about tetrabenazine. Now, tetrabenazine is a drug that uh, I have had a number of uh, 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 experiences with, with in a variety of med- uh, medical conditions, um, um, but it has been approved in, in 2008 for the treatment of chorea associated with Huntington disease. Obviously, uh, blepharospasm is a different condition, but it falls into the category of hyperkinetic uh, movement disorders. And many of the hyperkinetic movement disorders that are manifested by abnormal involuntary movements uh, might uh, be uh, treated with tetrabenazine. Um, now, until uh, tetrabenazine uh, became um, uh, uh, used, uh, uh, drugs that block dopamine receptors were used prior to that. Uh, and uh, these are uh, referred to as neuroleptics, drugs that block dopamine receptors, and so examples would be Haldol, Thorazine, Stalazine, uh, and so, uh, drugs uh, such uh, such that. And these drugs uh, clearly could be potentially uh, effective in the treatment of blepharospasm, but can be associated with a variety of side effects, uh, including uh, sedation, the weight gain, and uh, most importantly, a condition called tardive dyskinesia. Dr. Kamala already mentioned tardive dyskinesia as a cause for blepharospasm. And there's nothing more than taking a patient with blepharospasm, with the benign essential blepharospasm, uh, and then being treated with these drugs, the neurotic drugs, and then develop tardive dyskinesia on top of that. So tetrabenazine has the main advantage. It does not cause tardive dyskinesia. Uh, it uh, uh, works through uh, blocking the so-called VMAT, the vesicular monomine transporter, which uh, basically transports dopamine into the presynaptic uh, vesicle. And blocking this VMAT uh, uh, then allows these, uh, this dopamine to stay in the cytoplasm, and then it's uh, oxidized through monomine oxidase and uh, uh, other mechanisms uh, in the cytoplasm. So as a result of uh, the inhibition of this VMAT2 by tetrabenazine, uh, this results in dopamine depletion, and uh, that is uh, the, the main mechanism by which this uh, drug works. Um, I first uh, started to use it in, ni- in 1979, got uh, permission from FDA to use it, treated thousands and thousands of patients with tetrabenazine, and I found it a very effective drug, but like any drug, it does have potential side effects namely drowsiness, mood changes, uh, uh, Parkinsonism, uh, and a number of other potential side effects. So it's a drug that has to be used uh, carefully by physicians who are uh, knowledgeable about the pharmacology and potential side effects of, of this drug. This is uh, an example of a patient who clearly benefited from tetrabenazine. Uh, now, this patient uh, had tardar dystonia, which is a form of tardar. The trouble keeping your eyes open? Uh, in this case, yeah. manifested by peripheral spasm, by trouble spine, reading, watching TV, face, driving, or mandible dystonia, lingual uh, fungus uh, dystonia, uh, uh, cervical dystonia. So uh, she has. Uh, what about your uh, neck? Uh, uh, does that bother you? Cervical dystonia. Yeah. Actually, I don't need the sound. So. Um, 
And uh, here you can see uh, after tetrabenazine, her eyes are open and she essentially has no involuntary movements. Uh, so that's just an example of how tetrabenazine can be useful in patients with blepharospasm, in this case, tardive blepharospasm or tardive dystonia. Now, since we are in Colorado and everybody is uh, interested in marijuana, uh, I thought that I would uh, at least uh, highlight uh, this paper we uh, recently published uh, with uh, my colleagues at the University of Colorado, uh, particularly Dr. Kluger, uh, where we uh, systematically reviewed the literature on uh, cannabinoids and uh, in the treatment of variety of uh, movement disorders. And uh, again, I don't have time to discuss it in any detail, but uh, can just tell you that uh, there's at, at this time no solid evidence that marijuana improves blepharospasm. Having said that, uh, uh, mar marijuana certainly does have some muscle relaxing properties. Um, and many patients tell me uh, that when they smoke marijuana or have uh, or ingest edible marijuana, uh, that uh, their blepharospasm gets better. I'm not recommending it, uh, but uh, uh, Dr. Berman uh, is the only one in Colorado, I think, who can prescribe the, uh, marijuana for blepharospasm, so you can talk to him. Um, uh, now, I should point out, I have a potential conflict of interest uh, here, um, and that is my son who lives in Denver is a marijuana CPA, uh, so I, I want to fully disclose my, my potential uh, conflict of interest. Now, we talked about a number of muscles that are involved in blepharospasm, but one muscle that has not been mentioned by any of the speakers is the Mueller muscle. And uh, I just wanted to uh, uh, briefly review the, the importance of Mueller muscle that's uh, shown here. Actually, this point is a little bit too big, but um, basically the, it's a muscle that also elevates the eyelid. And here you see um, uh, an autopsy, a cadaver, uh, you can see the uh, the, um, this Mueller muscle, which uh, when contracting, it elevates the eyelid. And uh, the, the, very little attention has been paid to this particular muscle, uh, but uh, it's an important muscle for a number of reasons. Um, when activated, uh, that muscle actually can elevate the eyelid, and therefore we thought it might be helpful uh, in the treatment of blepharospasm and also ptosis. So I want to just share with you some of the preliminary data on uh, the use of aproclonidine, which is an alpha-2 adrenergic receptor agonist, and as such, it activates this Mueller muscle. Um, and uh, we um, started to um, study this particular uh, medication, the intraocular uh, uh, um, uh, medication uh, for the treatment of blepharospasm, and later I'll uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, the, the use of the medication in the treatment of ptosis. So this was just uh, an abstract that we recently presented at the Movement Disorder Congress in Berlin. Uh, very pre preliminary data, seven patients uh, who were uh, treated with uh, aproclonidine, particularly in, uh, patients who wore off from their botulinum toxin and came in uh, for their um, re-injection. And uh, we thought that it might be helpful to uh, try aproclonidine to see if we can at least transiently alleviate their blood force spasm. Now, I want to show you a videotape of uh, 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 at least one of the patients. Uh, so he clearly has a very severe uh, blood force spasm. Um, and uh, after application of aproclonidine eye drops, uh, his eyes uh, remain open. The effects are relatively transient, maybe two to four hours. Uh, but for some patients, uh, that may be enough to help them function better, drive better, maybe read better, um, and we're going to uh, pursue it further. Okay, let me now turn to botulinum toxin, which all of you are familiar with, uh, and uh, I think all of us recognize uh, it's the treatment of choice. Um, when we first uh, started to look into botulinum toxin, um, uh, you know, obviously a lot of people were very skeptical, and uh, I remember when I first submitted uh, my protocol to our institutional review board, uh, the chairman of the review board called me and said, you want to do what? Uh, and he just couldn't believe that I was going to inject uh, this uh, potent toxin into uh, eyelids and other muscles, um, and uh, finally he gave me an approval. Uh, so that resulted in the first double-blind placebo-controlled study uh, in uh, patients with blepharospasm, cranial dystonia, and cervical dystonia. And uh, I want to, again, acknowledge the support of the Benign Essential Blepharospasm Research Foundation. This was their first research grant, um, and uh, without that support, I don't think that study uh, would have been done. 
It was a relatively small study, but it was a controlled study, and the data from that study was used uh, uh, in support of uh, Allergan's application uh, to the FDA to get botulinum toxin approved uh, for the treatment of uh, blepharospasm. So uh, everybody, is, I think, is familiar with uh, the action of botulinum toxin. I just want to review it very uh, quickly uh, for those of you who may not be familiar. So botulinum toxin is a complex molecule. It consists of a, of a heavy chain and a light chain. Uh, this is the uh, presynaptic uh, terminal. Uh, that complex uh, uh, then uh, um, is, uh, um, uh, 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 undergoes endocytosis, and it's the light chain uh, that is then released and uh, the reason why I want to show you this is that uh, the light chain also contains zinc or zinc peptidase. And uh, it's this light chain which is active uh, in that it acts on uh, various proteins um, in the plasma membrane, for example, such as SNAP25 uh, or in this case syntaxin uh, or on the membranes of the presynaptic vesicle that contains the acetylcholine. And by cleaving these proteins, uh, such as the VAM, synaptoprevin, SNAP25, syntaxin, uh, it prevents the release of acetylcholine into the neuromuscular junction and causes um, weakness of uh, the muscle. So that's, in, in a very, very brief way, uh, is the way that botulinum toxin works. Now, um, I mentioned zinc peptidase, and that leads me to the um, uh, point I uh, just want to briefly make and, uh, about the use of zinc potentially as a, as a, as a way to uh, um, enhance the effects of botulinum toxin. Um, this is from a study by Dr. Soparkar, who uh, has an appointment at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, um, and uh, he studied uh, zinc in the form of zytase. Uh, in a variety of conditions, including the facial uh, uh, wrinkles and uh, blepharospasm, and facial spasm, and concluded uh, that uh, the use of Zytase uh, at least uh, four days before and on the day of the injection might possibly prolong uh, the effects of, of botulinum toxin. Uh, this study obviously needs to be replicated, um, uh, but uh, I must say a number of my patients do say that when they take Zytase, uh, then it, it does prolong uh, the effects of botulinum toxin. Um, I don't know why this is here, but um, uh, so this is, uh, uh, for some reason this video doesn't play, but it uh, doesn't write. I was going to show you a video of a patient uh, who is fine. Was it, I don't know why it's, uh, oh, okay. So let me just show you this pa patient. Um, this is a patient with progressive supranuclear palsy. We mentioned PSP as a, uh, a condition that can be associated with blepharospasm and, more importantly, apraxia of eyelid opening, as this patient has. And Dr. Kamala showed uh, a picture of this uh, patient uh, and how she's using her fingers to pry her eyes open. Uh, so um, she has not only blepharospasm, but she has this apraxia of eyelid opening we talked about. And here's uh, an example of how botulinum toxin can improve uh, not only the blepharospasm, but also her apraxia of eyelid opening. So she's instructed to close and open her eyes, and she's able to do that. Um, so um, we may have a chance to talk a little bit more about apraxia of eyelid opening later. So currently, there are four products that are available in the United States uh, for the treatment of a variety of conditions, namely uh, dystonia. Um, and all of you are familiar with Botox, but uh, uh, sort of a generic name, if you will, um, for Botox is Ona Botulinum Toxin A. This port is another uh, type of Botulinum Toxin, and the uh, uh, other name is Abo Botulinum Toxin A. Zeomin is Inco Botulinum Toxin A, and Myoblock, um, and in Europe it's called Neuroblock, is a Rimo Botulinum uh, B. Now, this uh, latter product uh, uh, is the only uh, type B form of Botulinum Toxin all the other products are type A botulinum toxin. That's important because they are immunologically different. Uh, so uh, if a patient develops a resistance, antibodies against type A botulinum toxin, uh, they may respond to type B botulinum toxin. So that's really the take home message uh, for you uh, with respect to the different types of botulinum toxin. We could spend a long time talking about the different properties of the different botulinum toxin, but they basically work um, in the same way. Uh, obviously, Botox has the largest number of approved indications, uh, for, namely cervical dystonia, strabismus, blepharospasm, uh, and other disorders. Uh, the only other uh, type of botulinum toxin that's approved for blepharospasm is uh, incobotulinum toxin or zeomin. 
Now, um, uh, there is another product that's currently in development, and I'm working uh, um, closely with Revanse Therapeutics, a uh, company that's developing a new type of botulinum toxin called RT002. Uh, this particular uh, product uh, has uh, somewhat different properties. It has an excipient uh, that allows the product to stay within the target uh, uh, muscle uh, for a longer period of time, and as such, uh, may have fewer side effects and perhaps longer duration of response. Um, uh, the data that we have right now is still um, confidential, preliminary, and I'm not going to be able to share it with you, uh, but uh, I'm obviously encouraged by the development of, of this product. And also, I should mention that the company is also uh, uh, working on a topical gel uh, so that could be applied uh, to the skin. Uh, this may have application for wrinkles and sweating or hyperhidrosis, I'm not sure it's going to be terribly effective for blepharospasm, but nevertheless, uh, that's probably going to be uh, studied. Now, how effective is botulinum toxin? I think everybody here knows that botulinum toxin is very, very effective. Uh, how many of you have been treated with botulinum toxin? I think almost all of you. Um, and how many of you have not responded to botulinum toxin? I just want to know. That's interesting. So there's maybe two or three, maybe four. So. Uh, obviously, 90% of uh, patients uh, so respond to botulinum toxin. There, there are uh, some patients, uh, unique patients, who for some reason don't respond, and we can talk about it later on why that might be. But uh, recently, the American Academy of Neurology uh, uh, took a, a long project, <laughs> and uh, Dr. Hallett and Dr. Camilla, who worked uh, uh, on this project as well, know that uh, this project took about five years to complete, uh, and it was, uh, for me at least, it was one of the most frustrating projects I ever worked on uh, for a number of reasons, because we had to adhere to certain guidelines, um, how to review uh, the data and the evidence uh, that botulinum toxin is effective and safe for a variety of conditions. So I just want to summarize uh, uh, this uh, report, which was just published a couple of months ago. And uh, this is the summary of the report. Uh, basically, what, what uh, we concluded uh, was that in, uh, in order to pay, uh, for patient to uh, uh, have a level A evidence, meaning that the, the uh, botulinum toxin is effective, not just probably effective, but effective, they have to meet certain criteria, number of certain double bond placebo control studies, and so on. And you can see that for, bot for blepharospasm, uh, botulinum toxin actually never received or never reached that level of evidence, and uh, only level B evidence uh, was recommended for uh, botulinum toxin, probably effective for two products, incobotulinum toxin or zeomin and onabotulinum toxin or, or Botox. So uh, it's obviously surprising because all of you know how effective it is. Uh, all of us uh, recognize it's very effective, but uh, for various reasons, uh, the level of evidence uh, did not reach uh, um, um, enough evidence to recommend level A. So level A requires, rating A requires at least two consistent class one studies, you know, very rigorously conducted studies. Level B uh, requires only one class study and some uh, two class two studies. Um, and anyway, this was the recommendation that on a botulinum toxin or Botox and incobotulinum toxin or um, uh, uh, zeomin should be re uh, considered probably uh, and is probably effective uh, botulinum toxin um, uh, uh, the uh, a uh, the able botulinum toxin over this port got only possibly effective uh, recommendation. So there are many reasons why that happens. Uh, uh, to be honest, if I now go back to my institutional review board and tell them that I want to study botulinum toxin um, uh, in blepharospasm and compare it to placebo. Uh, they would laugh at me, say, how, how could you even possibly consider doing that? Uh, we know that botulinum toxin is very effective uh, for blepharospasm and would be unethical uh, to do that kind of study uh, comparing it to, to placebo. So I don't think uh, we'll ever get, get to the uh, level A evidence for uh, botulinum toxin in blepharospasm uh, because uh, placebo control studies uh, are going to be very difficult. 
so one of the studies that was used uh, to uh, at least uh, uh, provide level B evidence um, uh, was this double-blind placebo control study, and I just found out that that reprint is available um, uh, outside. So uh, during uh, lunch, if you want to uh, grab one of the reprints, uh, uh, this was a study that I conducted with a number of investigators, including uh, Dr. Camilla, and uh, this clearly showed um, uh, that uh, it was an effective drug. There are a number of other uh, uh, studies uh, using um, uh, incobotulum toxin or zeom in, uh, in the treatment of uh, blepharospasm, um, but for the time being, uh, we, we have only the level B evidence. So I just want to say a couple more, uh, more things about uh, botulinum toxin. So even though uh, most of us agree that botulinum toxin is the treatment of choice for blepharospasm, there are many limitations uh, to botulinum toxin. Uh, one of the limitations is that uh, uh, it doesn't last long enough. Uh, so uh, this is a survey which just published, and I want to share that with you. Um, this was uh, um, a survey from multiple centers, and what they found was that uh, about 40% of uh, patients, uh, they, uh, the effects of botulinum toxin declined uh, within eight weeks, and about 70% uh, within 10 weeks. So uh, many patients, even though they were pleased and satisfied with the effect of the botulinum toxin, uh, they were frustrated by this relatively short duration of response, and they would prefer being injected uh, more often. So many subjects, at least half, would prefer an injection interval of less than tw uh, 12 weeks and about a third of uh, less than 10 weeks interval. Uh, so that is one of the challenges and unmet needs uh, in the treatment of uh, uh, blepharospasm with botulinum toxin that uh, uh, many patients would like to be re-injected more frequently than every four months, which is the standard pretty much for, for our patients. Now, another problem with botulinum toxin, of course, uh, is potential side effects, blurring of vision, tosses. And I just wanted to, uh, again, go back to this drug, aproclonidine, that I mentioned before, and how we might uh, use this, uh, this drug uh, in the relief of tosses or droopy eyelid. Uh, so... Um, here the, you can see a, a patient be, before and after aproglinidine. You can see the improvement in her ptosis. Another patient, uh, she has ptosis here and improvement with aproglinidine after uh, the installation of aproglinidine. Another patient with ptosis here and improvement with uh, aproglinidine. So we are beginning to use aproglinidine more and more, not only in patients with blepharospasm, but also in patients who have ptosis as a side effect of uh, botulinum toxin. Uh, since we are talking about botulinum toxin, uh, I want to invite you to uh, uh, the next uh, Congress on uh, botulinum toxin to, in Madrid in January. Uh, as the current president of the International Neurotoxin Association, uh, I'm responsible not only for the uh, scientific uh, uh, content of this uh, uh, meeting, but also for financial um, uh, success. So uh, those of you who would like to support us, by all means, uh, you, uh, you can get in touch with me. And I certainly hope that the sponsors of this symposium, will, uh, including Allergan and Mertz and others, uh, will support this particular meeting. And finally, I just want to say one word about surgery. Somebody asked about central surgery. Uh, Dr. Anderson is going to talk about peripheral uh, surgery. Uh, this is a, a, a report uh, of a patient who underwent deep brain stimulation uh, for the treatment of blepharospasm. So deep brain stimulation is a technique we've been using for 20 years or so for the treatment of tremors and dystonias and a number of other uh, movement disorders, but it's rarely ever used just for blepharospasm. And this particular uh, individual uh, apparently benefited from uh, this uh, surgical intervention. Um, so again, I want to congratulate uh, the Blepharospasm Research Foundation on uh, 35 years of success, and especially want to thank Mary Lou uh, uh, for everything she has done. Um, I, I will reserve my additional remarks uh, uh, for this afternoon if I have the opportunity. Uh, and uh, again, I want to uh, wish uh, uh, the Blepharospasm Foundation uh, all the best for, on their 35th birthday. So thank you very much.